I'm quite thrilled to hear that the left's doing so well because it doesn't look like that from our angle that we've, we, you know, we've, we've conquered the universities and uh, we've conquered the... It really doesn't feel like it. If we accept the premise that objectivity is never quite possible, but as Phil said, you know, we should be striving for it, what would be a healthy alternative? And my, my answer to that would be that we have a public square or a national conversation that is as intellectually diverse um, and vibrant as possible, that we, we genuinely have um, a range of views and perspectives and beliefs and voices within that national conversation. So at least we can um, interrogate uh, and explore um, you know, various truths as we, we see them. Um, but that is not happening today. Uh, that is partly why we saw the political uh, volatility of the last 13 years. It's why 2024 um, will, will likely be a, a sort of return to 2016 in many ways, because many voters out there are looking at the media and have been looking at the media class and increasingly feel that uh, that viewpoint diversity, you know, we talk endlessly about diversity, except when it comes to intellectual diversity and viewpoint diversity, isn't really there. Uh, and that's also true, by the way, where, where I work, the universities. I mean, if you look, for example, at Britain's universities, the ratio of, of left-wing to right-wing academics has gone from three to one in the 1960s to closer to 10 to one today. I do think that's a problem. So within the context of this national conversation, I think we've lost something quite special, uh, which is why the media landscape, as I say, is fragmenting at the, at the pace at which it is. I mean, if you look at our flagship media programs, Radio 4 Today, lost 2 million listeners since Brexit. You look at the rise of new entrants, as I say, GB News, Talk TV, uh, YouTube, online space, and so on. Um, all of that, and, and also, by the way, the collapse of public confidence in media, all of that, I think, is reflective of the way in which many voters have now come to the conclusion that the viewpoint diversity that should be there, that should be giving expression to values that are held by much of the rest of the country but are not necessarily held by the people in the corridors of power, is not really, is not really there. Uh, so the, the alternative, in my mind, would be reforming the institutions ensuring that people who are in the media class are not just the sons and daughters of senior journalists, that we actually have a serious sustained attempt to get different voices and values onto the comment pages, into the newspapers, into the universities, that uh, the epistemic class, which determines what is socially acceptable and what is not socially acceptable, is, is broadened out. And I think that, in turn, would, would perhaps get us closer to this, this, this idea of having a vibrant public square. Go for it, Phil. <laughs> the, I agree we want the, most, the, the widest possible plurality of voices and, and range of opinion. I agree, too, that it's narrower than it should be. But one of those, range, one of those opinions I want in there, one of those ways of approaching information is to have some impartial voices. That's precisely what I think, where I think it sits. That um, I don't think being entirely objective and being impartial and quite the same thing either. But to have within the landscape of enormously proliferating voices, some institutions who have a public service regulatory obligation to seek to tell the truth as they see it, whilst we accept if we're going to erect a high philosophical standard, we're going to judge them as failures. I think that's a really weak reason for not trying that. I think there's very significant successes in British journalism with respect to the reporting of the news. It is, I repeat, a very different thing from offering an opinion. None of us are under any obligation to be impartial. It would be a very boring debate if we were. This is an exchange of views. There's no requirement for impartiality here, quite the contrary. But when you're reporting the news on the six o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news, to then attempt, as far as you can, to tell the truth as it is and say nothing that is not true, and to weigh it for news value, these are noble things to do. They do not amount to an absolutely definitive and determinate idea of impartiality. Of course they don't. But nevertheless, it's still different from what I do. 
in the Times. And I think that's the central point here, that within that plurality, there is space for that kind of institution. One other point is I, I take the point that the plurality isn't as wide as it should be, but firstly, I think that the online journalism has proliferated it enormously. I think that the days in which, it's quite interesting, we're here a couple of days after Rupert Murdoch steps down uh, from the top job at News UK, in a sense is the end of an era. Um, the notion that the, the, the media that I have worked in exercises the kind of power they claimed when they claimed the Sun won the 1992 general election, I think would be ridiculous. I think if I put it the other way and I said, I'm a comment writer for the Times, so every Monday you will all wake up, if you're Times readers, with no ideas in your head, and you will then gain your opinions from what I tell you, you'd all think I was patronizing and stupid. No, but, and yet, that's the kind of idea you get of media power sometimes. So I don't buy the idea of media power quite like that. I think it's a conversation between people. I think big media institutions, and the Times is a very good example, follow their readers as much as they lead them. And the Brexit referendum was a very good case in point, where all of the senior people at the Times were Brexiteers, all of them, but the Times readers were 70-30 for remaining in the European Union. So the paper took that view. It absolutely took that view because it was following its readers. Commercial decision. It's got nothing to do with any propaganda or anything like that. It's pure capitalism. And that happens all the time. That institutions follow their readers as much as they lead them. So I don't buy this sort of tabula rasa view of the people that they're simply taking it in. I think it's patronizing. One final thought. The media does expand a bit. It doesn't, it's not entirely inelastic. So when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, for example, a few voices did emerge who were pro-Corbyn voices, as indeed they should have done. You know, Owen Jones, Ash Sarka, Grace Blakely, Aaron Bastani. There were people out there who were pro-Corbyn voices. Probably not enough, but nevertheless, it wasn't entirely impervious to change. Well, I mean, again, some really interesting ideas here. I mean, I actually find myself appropriately enough, kind of, uh, I agree with elements of, of, of both of what my fellow panelists have said, and then I sort of think I might be diverging off again in, a, in yet another direction. So the idea that you would have um, certain regulatory organizations or institutions that somehow, I mean, Phil, if I follow you correctly, what we're almost talking about is sort of creating some sort of regulatory bodies that actually are almost slightly out of the flow of the practical realities of what media and journalism are today because we have it already. Well, we have it already. I'm we just have it about already. The obligations and that of, of the BBC to... and ITV and Channel 4. That's exactly. All. So we, we have those mechanisms in place and we ought to be sort of giving them sort of tougher, more, more robust powers perhaps, or maybe trying to extend their, their capacity not just to advise, but to actually act or impose certain guidance. That's interesting. I think actually I would be. I would come back to Matt's point, this idea about what actually what we're, what's really at stake and what I think I would say is important going forward is, is to do plurality in media better and actually have genuinely more, I mean, so there's two ways you can, you can do, you can approach this sort of impartiality or you can either say, right, well, we're going to represent a lot more viewpoints and we're going to do so thoroughly, not in a sort of quick shock jock flash headline way or a way that's been incredibly marginalized. I don't know if anyone's following at the moment some of the very um, fraught media coverage of the voice debate in Australia, which is heading into a referendum about whether indigenous people should have a permanent voice in parliament. And that is a classic example of how actually um, there's, a, there's an absolute barrage of media coverage on this topic constantly. And yet, actually, if you drill into it a bit closer, you're talking um, very few genuinely diverse, different sorts of opinions represented. I must admit, Matt, as someone who's sort of leftward leading, but sort of um, not kind of institutionally committed, shall we say, um, I'm, I'm quite thrilled to hear that the left's doing so well because it doesn't look like that from our angle. That we've, we, you know, we've, we've conquered the universities and uh, we've conquered the. It really doesn't feel like it. It actually feels like the, the complete opposite. And it actually, I think, you know, again, representing a diverse viewpoint here would say that actually we're hearing the other voices coming through louder and stronger and clearer. And that's why I mentioned the Australia case, for example, where what you've got there is quite an incredible case study of going in to that referendum, we had a clear lead for the 
traditionally liberal kind of yes vote. Yes, we should have a committee in Canberra for Indigenous people. Excellent. That's what that's what we all want. And then an astonishing combination of the right and the right's ability to tell stories that the media can pick up and spread quickly, and not just through traditional media, but other forms of this new online world, which I think is, is just so resistant to any form of traditional regulation. Um, you, we've had a complete change, a complete transformation of that result, and it is not looking good for the yes vote come October. So I suppose I'm interested in following up or going further with this idea of how you genuinely do plurality in the media. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the other question we have to ask here at this juncture as well is who is evaluating truth? Because yeah. that has become obviously a, a, an incredibly important central question not only in newsrooms across the world, but also in households at the dinner table. We now sit around many people, families, and argue about what is true, which is something that I think is, uh, you know, Donald Trump spoke to when he said that we were kind of a bit over truth. We'd, we'd gone past the era of truth and into a kind of post-truth age. Um, perhaps he is also someone who's, who's been part of that. I, I think uh, speaking about regulatory bodies is difficult here with that in mind because, of course, how do we ensure that those bodies are trying to fulfill uh, an urge to a striving for actual truth if we are so unsure ourselves as to what actual truth is? Hmm. Well, that's for you, Matt. That's a big one for Matt. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. Let me just quickly pick up. Let me just quickly pick up on the university's point, and then I'm going to come back to the truth point. Because in a way, even though we're talking about the media, there, there is probably no institution in society that you know proclaims itself to be as committed to truth and objectivity and impartiality as the universities. And if you don't think the universities lean to the left, I would be really curious to see what your day-to-day -day experience is like in your university, because in my view, and let me be provocative because we're not all here to, to get along and agree, let me just say one thing. The universities in this country have completely given up on any pretense to be objective, independent, impartial institutions. Okay? And if you disagree with that, give me one day and I'll give you a tour of universities and show you what I mean. They've become openly political organizations, and in some ways that's how they started. They started as very religious institutions that were pushing an agenda. But in the mid 20th century, late 20th century, there was an attempt to commit to truth seeking and impartiality and objectivity. Today, that is simply no longer the case. Ideological litmus tests are used across the board if you want to get research grants, if you want to get jobs, if you want to get promoted. If you challenge the liberal consensus, if you challenge things like gender identity theory, opposition to Brexit, particular interpretations of British history, uh, you basically will experience some form of indirect or direct discrimination. And if you want the evidence of that, there's a lovely book in the tent over there called Values, Voice and Virtue, which will present all of the evidence to you. And the reason I point to that is because in a way it's reflective of what's happening in other aspects of our national life. Um, for those who do challenge this narrow orthodoxy within our um, public square that is basically anti-Brexit, pro-globalization, pro-migration, socially liberal, um, which basically speaks to about 20% of the country. If you look at the British Social Attitude Survey, uh, the latest edition came out last week, it suggests that 20% of Britain are strongly and consistently socially liberal on a whole range of issues. If you challenge some of those assumptions, some of those beliefs, um, you are variously told that you are buying into misinformation, that you are um, pursuing half-truths or you have been manipulated by media and so on and so forth, to the point where even fact-checkers and reality checks and so on, if you look at them closely, are basically becoming openly partisan, is what I would argue. Matt, can right? I ask you a can, I, can I just, just, just so if you, if you challenge this consensus, you will find yourself um, essentially being gaslit by many institutions. So if you ask yourself the question, why are so many people rebelling politically, culturally, 
socially, it is because when they look at these institutions, they do not see people like them who reflect their worldview. What can we do about it? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.